The title of today's message is It's Just a Curse. Yep, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, and uh, to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Well, that's great. The ground's cursed. And all your life, you're going to struggle. You know, sometimes we look out across the hills, and they're so beautifully yellow. And I say, God, I want some rain. God, we'd like the grass to grow. You know, it would be great if we could get a little more production, a little greater productivity. And it feels like sometimes it's just not that productive. And it feels like it's such a fight. And not everybody tries to raise crops. Not everybody tries to raise livestock. And you know what? You talk to people, and you know what you hear? It feels like it's just a fight. It feels like it's just a struggle. It feels like it's difficult. And it's because the ground is cursed. And I've been looking and I researched and I thought and I looked through the Bible and I'm like, but who cursed the ground? God. Who had the power to place the curse? Who had the power to remove the curse? And so we have to get to the place that we recognize that it's just cursed. And so we've got to get to the place that we're just going to have a little fun with the curse. So as you guys know, we took a little trip. Now, when you make a trip from here to... D.C., it's like a 24-hour drive. That's if you do not stop, pass, go, or use the bathroom at all. Should you need to use the bathroom, which some of us do, you may have to stop. Should you need gas, Google doesn't calculate that in the maps. Guess what? It's no longer a 24-hour drive. Should you need to stop more times than before? And now we're getting to the stage where I'm passing the kids on the bathroom stops that I need versus how many they need. This is getting kind of embarrassing. There was a day I'm like, you can hold it. Now I'm like, we're going to stop. <laughs> Anybody in the car need to stop? No, we're good. Well, I'm not. <laughs> so you realize that things change, and so now this drive is going to take a while, right? But we need to also conserve on space in the car. We want to go on a dime, so we decide we're going to pack a cooler with food and snacks because we don't want to stop all the time. And I'm telling you what, they say the economy is at a record, a record high, and so is inflation, right? They're so proud of food, they're charging us a time and a half than it was before just a few years ago. So you don't want to stop and buy anything because it costs you half a fortune. So you've got to buy all this stuff ahead of time. You've got to try and pack it so, you know, there's stuff all around us up to our necks, right? So you can only get so much in the car. What that means? We should only be bringing our essentials. Essentials mean we're not going to be bringing 50 different sets of clothes and all this other stuff. And we're not really trying to bring a bunch of frilly-dilly stuff. And we're really trying to just have essentials. But put six people in a car with essentials, and you fill it up. Now, there are several people in this car that drive the same kind of car we do. And have about the same size of family. And your car is full even when you don't pack it full of a bunch of stuff that you need on a trip. So it's a lot, right? And we find ourselves at this trip, this place down the road, 
maybe needing to do a little bit of laundry a few days in the trip so we have clean clothes to continue on with the trip. And Bree says, you know, we're supposed to kind of be on vacation. I just don't really want to be doing all this laundry and, you know, maybe we can find a place that we can do it or maybe the hotel can just do, do they have laundry service? Can we figure this out? So we don't have to, you know, get bogged down, but we do need clean clothes and, you know, we're hot and sweaty and, you know, it was 103 degrees and you're walking around and it's just hot. And clothes stink. Like, this is just a reality, right? We're people, we stink. That's, that's how it goes. Let's just be real for a minute, right? Like, this stuff happens. And so I, dun, da, 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 I'm going to help. I said, baby, I'll do the laundry. I got this. You sit and relax in this hotel. You've been doing a lot. I've got the evening. I got done with my conference, and I'm like, I, I, I can do this. I said, how about you give me the dirty clothes? I arranged with the hotel, found out they didn't have a laundry service, but they had a laundry room that you can get. You got to get a bunch of quarters going. So I had some change, found out how much it would cost, went down to the front desk, started cashing in, getting a pocket full of quarters. Still somehow came up a buck short. I still know how I did that because I know I counted it out at the desk, but somehow between getting there and back up to the room, I lost a buck. Had to go back down a second time to get more quarters, but that's beside the point. So we get back up there, and Bree has commenced to fill in like the, you know, like the little plastic sacks full of clothes for me to wash. And do you know what? They even sorted them for me so I wouldn't mess up. In this imperfect world, they were sorted for me. Because remember, this land is cursed. They know that if I just put all those clothes in the laundry, we could probably have trouble. We know that we live in a world that's fallen. We know that everything we do is going to be a battle. So we just have to have fun with it. We have to get used to it, right? We have to get used to the battle and embrace the battle. Who cares? It's going to be tough. So I'm like, all right, I can take this laundry, ask a couple girls to help me because all of a sudden I realize we got like six or seven bags of these Walmart sacks full of clothes. And I had gone and scoped out the laundry room. There was a washer, two washers and two dryers. I thought I got a setup of whites, lights, lights I mean, and darks. I got this. Gotta go up out there. Da, 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 da. We go in that room. By the way, it's 103. I'm not making it up. And that room, I think, was 103. Not making that up either. Walk in there. I don't think they had proper ventilation. Okay? I don't think they had proper ventilation. It's beside the point. It, Washer's got a hole about this big. I'm not making it up, am I? I wash machines this big around. <laughs> and I got six little sacks, am I? I can get this done. I'm going to get this done. I read the little sign on the wall. It says it takes a half hour per load. It's already going to cost a half a million dollars just to do one load anyway. So I'm like, well... You know, we're going to get that in there, you know. And now here's the other dilemma. The darks are less than the lights. You know, I have a theory on that. I'm going to tell you what it is. Here's the theory. It's summertime. We're wearing lighter colored clothes. That's what I think. And so that means that I could be tempted to put some of the lights in the darks to balance that out. That would make sense, wouldn't it? You all know it would make sense, wouldn't it? But I know we're in a fallen world. I know the devil will attack me. I know as soon as I do that, I'm going to have a shirt that's coming out that's supposed to be white or light with some black streaks in it. I know it's going to happen. So I don't. I do not compromise my values, my morals. I do not give it up. Plus, I'm being watched by Lily. So I knew. 
she'd go right back and tell her mom he did it all wrong. So open up that wash machine. All right, I got this, I got this, you know. Psh, putting those clothes in there. Putting those clothes in. <laughs> you know how it is. Come on. You know when you buy the sleeping bag and it comes in a sack like that and you're like, and I'm supposed to get this thing back in there? You know what I'm talking about. You got to sit there and stuff your boot in it the whole way to put the whole thing back in there. And it gets back in there, but it rips all the, all the stitches as it goes back in. But that's how it gets back in there. It is only made to go in that sack once. I got it in there. I got every, every sock was in that wash machine. Huh? How about it? Round of applause. That's right. I got it done. I got it done. Now. I did notice there was a sign on the washer that said no more than a quarter cup of laundry detergent or it could cause problems. I didn't read the rest of it. It was boring, so I don't know what else it was saying. But I figured that, you know, <laughs> they say I have attention deficit disorder. I don't know. I didn't finish reading the book. It's too boring. But the point that I'm trying to get to is, is I look at that and I was like, oh, oh, these clothes might not smell good if I don't put some extra in there. Once again, once again, I resisted the trouble because I knew the devil would attack and I'd have soap running down seven stories in that hotel. I knew I'd be like an episode of Curious George and I'd be running go, rah, 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 you know, to the elevator trying to find a man in the yellow hat. So I left it be. I put the quarter cup in there and said, well, a little bit is better than nothing, right? Did the other thing, set that thing, set the timer on my phone, prayed to God that nobody would steal our clothes. But then I thought, well, good luck trying to get them out of the wash machine. Anyway, but left it be, ran that thing. Yeah, we got a fallen world. You're like, where's it getting to on this? You'll see. You'll see. Stick with me, kid. We'll go places. So left all that stuff. Come back a half hour later, move the clothes from the washer to the dryer. Now, what's dryer rule 101? Clean the stupid lint thing, right? I know that rule. In fact, at our house, I take it upon myself to ever so often take the thing out, go out with the air compressor, clean all the little tiny holes out. I really, you know, do it up nice. Show my wife I love her. I, I, I really try to help do that, that, you know, take care of those extra little things so it's not a burden, right? I clean that lint thing out. I put my $55 in the thing that, you know, it feels like it, it costs a fortune, you know. They're real proud of those wash machines and dryers. They're proud of that stuff. You'd think it had 14 karat gold inside there for how much they charge for you to do a load of laundry. But nonetheless... Put the clothes from the washer into the dryer. They didn't smell too bad. I did do a sniff test. Don't you lie to yourself. You all sniff your clothes. Don't tell me you don't. We all want to make sure they smell clean. It's no different than anybody else. You're all going to do a sniff test once. Time. Okay, I guess that'll pass, right? Who doesn't do that? Don't do, go to a restaurant. That's the first thing you do. You get a new napkin with your fork. You go to a restaurant. I sniff that napkin. If it smells like somebody's mouth, I'm not using their napkin. I'm like, give me a new one, right? I, uh, come on. Let's be real here. Yeah, everything has to have a sniff test. What if it, what if it isn't clean? And you're like, oh, 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 you know? So that, I don't know, wipe my mouth with that. So I sniff my clothes, make sure they're clean. Okay, so put them in. Put the $6,000 in there, shut the door. Come back, set my timer. Open the door to the laundry room. It's about 180 degrees in there and water's dripping from the ceiling. They don't have that place properly vented at all. And I recognize I am going to have to do the, the, the dryer all again. And I could go visit the lady at the front desk, and I got to give her more money, get a bunch more quarters. She had to go get a whole new roll for me just to do, just to do this laundry. And I had to get a chair to prop the door open, and I sat at a chair, watching everybody come and go at the hotel room, just sat there, I, you bet, doing my laundry here, got it all under control, while the, while the heat wave is just coming past my face, I'm dripping in sweat, 
right? As people are like, God, it's so hot up here. What the problem? And I got the heat wave coming down the hall, baby. I got both dryers running, and I'm like, that's me. Got it for you. But you know what? It got all done. And what do you think the moral of the story is? Clothes weren't dry. After two times, I put all the clothes back in the bag, brought them back, said, baby, I got some bad news. <laughs> We're going to have to hang some clothes in the hotel room because <laughs> they ain't drying. <laughs> and what we may do, and life goes on. But we had some pretty clean clothes, and we had some pretty dry clothes. Was it as clean and dry as at home? No. Was it stellar? No. But it was struggles. It was cursed. Because we live in a cursed world. Because there's struggles and there's challenges. And the only way you're going to overcome the struggles and the challenges is the favor of God. And the other part of that is your heart and your mindset in how you actually get through it. Because God's favor is what trumps the curse. I tried looking all over last night. Find one scripture, one scripture that says this is exactly how God trumps the curse. You can't. But what you can see is story after story of how his favor overcomes the curse. Think about this. Abraham and Lot. He takes care of his nephew. Abraham has a successful business. Lot has a successful business. But there's a little bit of friction going on. Genesis, you know, they're following this. Genesis chapter 12, you know. They're, they're starting to kind of get in each other's hair. Kind of get in each other's space. Because they're kind of, you know, running their cattle together a little too much. You know, I can kind of think about how that could become a problem when you're like, well, how do we divvy out whose animals are eating what and how much and how, how does this look and how does that work and what do we make that look like? And so Lot and Abraham make a decision. You know what? We've got to go find more land and we've got to make a plan. And here Abraham's heart. Abraham says... Lot, pick whatever you want, and I'll take whatever's left. Now, my family, we have, well, we have a bad habit. Sometimes we like ice cream. Now, I know none of you guys eat ice cream, but let me tell you, ice cream tastes very good. And if you put these things called Reese's Peanut Butter Cups in them, oh, it's special, okay? Now, the problem is, is at various vendors, when you go to get, I don't care who it is, the ice cream and then the cups, oh, right? But these, some of them are lazy. And so at the top is where most of the goodies are, right? And then you get at the bottom, it's mostly just ice cream, right? And so when you get that, he who gets to the cup first gets a lot of the, the good chunks, the good, the goodies, and if you get toward the bottom, you're kind of getting ripped off, right? So I'm thinking of Lot and Abraham, and I'm thinking, Abraham saying, go ahead, take the top, get all the good stuff. And I'm willing to make do with the junk. I'll take the junk. And I look at Car Colorado. Let's be real for a minute. This land is cursed. It's some of the last leftover land that nobody else wanted. It's some of the most unproductive. It's some of the least rained on. It's the genesis of the Dust Bowl. Let's get real. This land is rough. Okay? Does that make it bad? Abraham looked at Lot and said, get the good stuff. Yeah, take that nice land right along the pooter. You can have it irrigated. You get the water. You can have everything you want, Lot. Go get it. I give it to you. I want you to have the best of the best. 
Take my goodies. Get the crunchies. I'll do with the vanilla. Pray to God there's a couple goodies at the bottom, hopefully somewhere in there. Right? That's what he did. That's what we have. And we've all battled tumbleweeds like nobody else. Nobody understands what a tumbleweed problem is like we've understood up here. I'm not kidding. I mean, thousands of dollars worth of damage many of us have dealt with and our fences and everything else. We're still recovering from. Nobody knows that battle. Anybody seen the special on News 4 this year on tumbleweed that's devastated all the farmers? <laughs> no. Nobody cares, right? That isn't making mainstream media. It's nothing, right? Well, we're struggling. How are we just trying to keep it? I got texts coming to me all the time. Your cows are out. I know. Thanks for letting me know. They're cleaning the ditches for the neighbors. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing the best I can. I'm just trying to get stuff fixed. I'm trying to get through everything. I've worked hours and done miles of tumbleweeds just trying to get them out of the fence. I get it. The land's cursed. It doesn't mean it's not my land. It doesn't mean it's not for me. So listen to this. Genesis 13, verse 14 through 17. After Lot had gone... After Lot had taken the best of the best, this is what Abraham says. Or God says to Abraham, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants like that, like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you, oh hippie skippy. Thanks for the Dust Bowl. No, wait a second. Wait a second. Keep reading. Keep reading. Who stays successful and who gets bailed out? I keep talking about the anchor of where things are going in the world to come in our country and where things are happening. The leaders that are rising up. I see what God's doing out of this church and what God's doing out of our kids and what God's doing out of this area. And I see the likes of Abraham coming out of the cursed land. And we're going to be bailing out the lot. So when you see your land is cursed, don't forget, the favor of God that rests on you is the power that breaks the curse. And he will take care of you. And even though he got the dust bowl, even though he got the leftovers, he ended up with the greatest. He ended up with the greatest blessing of all time. And so we have to get to the place that we recognize that we're going to tackle our curse. We're not going to just stand back and go, oh, well, oh, no, 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 we're going to tackle our curse. I'm not kidding. God's been doing a work in me like never before to look at what we've been going through, to look at what we have seen, to look at what we've had to endure and say, I'm not backing down. I'm not going to just sit there and go, well, I hope everything works out. But every time I see anything, I jump back out and say, I'm tackling this. This is what I got. This is what I'm going to declare for God. So every time I see a cloud, every time I see that it's about to rain, I am praying. I am thanking God for the rain. We've got to get to the place where we're fasting and we're praying and we're seeking God for divine intervention over what we have and what we don't see. Because the miraculous is happening on what we have and what we don't see. We have no idea. The land's cursed. The laundry, the system was cursed. And we still made do with what we had, and it still worked out just fine. And I lived to tell the story. And we're all going to live to tell the story of all the attacks and all the frustrations. And we're going to make it through it. And the favor and the provision that sits on top of us is there. But sometimes we have to press in. Sometimes it is fasting and prayer. Sometimes it's other things that God calls us to do. But we're the ones that are going to be bailing out Lot. Because you know why? Pressure makes diamonds. The harder it pushes on us, we get incredibly creative. We get incredibly wise. We learn things that other people don't even think about. Because of how good we have to be. I mean, I was just talking to somebody recently about our garden. We get whipped with the wind so bad. And it's so hot. 
that we learn how to preserve and conserve on moisture like nobody else understands around here. And that matters. That's valuable. We ever end up in any type of water crisis around here, along the front range, they're going to definitely, definitely have to learn a lot of things. God's shown us a lot of valuable things. And, and I just want us to, to, to recognize that we may find ourselves actually witnessing prophecy in our own life. Let's look at Jeremiah 23, verse 10. It says, For the land is full of adultery, and it lies under a curse, and the land itself is in mourning. Its wilderness pastures are dried up, for they all do evil and abuse what power they have. But we have to look at that and take the junk land and do the impossible. And how do we do the impossible? We do the impossible by pressing on, pressing in, fasting, and prayer. And what we don't do is give up or give in. We walk out, we stay empowered, and we say, my God is the curse breaker, and he takes care of everything, and my God reigns. Will you please stand with me? I want to say a prayer, a blessing over everybody. I believe that we may have cursed land, but Jesus is the curse breaker. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for blessing us. I thank you, Lord, for your favor on us. I thank you, Lord, that you give us praises. We're going to live to tell of the works that you do in our life. I ask you, Father God, divine interventions, divine appointments. Give us miracles, Father God. Give us praises and testimonies to tell other people. When other people are like, well, we saw this or we had that, we can say, and look what God did for us. Give us that testimony at the tip of our tongue. May your favor continue to rest on us, that we are prepared and equipped and able to help Lot when the time comes. Thank you, Father God, that you love us so much. You gave us Jesus, died on the cross for our sins. Your blood washes us as clean as snow. Father God, I love you. We love you. We dedicate our hearts and our lives to you. Help us to be your provosts. Help us to go out this week and be the people you've called us to be and work in the world you've called us to work in. May your favor continue to rest and your, just fill our heart with an abundance of your love, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.